I, I know this is after lunch, so I'll, I'll try to make it interesting. Well, I think it is interesting. Let, let, I'm really curious to know what you think. Um, so, title of my talk, uh, PySeft, Data Science on Data You Cannot See. Um, a little bit about myself, or as I call it, uh, a, a short summary of myself in logos. Um, I'm a, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. Um, my background is in computer science. I've been working in research for many years, um, machine learning and data science mostly, and also working from uh, a data science perspective with medical data. And this is why I became interested in working on private data for machine learning. And this is what I'm going to talk about to you today. Uh, but like behind the mask, this, that's me, I promise you. I actually work with um, OpenMind at the moment. OpenMind is a non-profit organization. And what we try to do is to envision a, uh, the possibility to have um, al to unlocking research and, and machine learning and data science in general in, in order to use everyone's uh, data and at the same time uh, like everyone is entitled to keep the data. So everyone can use data, but withholding uh, privacy information. Also a uh, fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, and this is where I started uh, getting uh, interested uh, in uh, privacy preserving techniques. Uh, also Python Geeks, you might have seen me in other conferences as well, and I'm, I'm a contributor to the Python community for many years. Well, uh, along the lines, I also play Magic the Gathering just because, you know, why not? Um, all right, so um, let me start this talk by saying that nowadays, algorithms influence how people spend the time. And because algorithms are actually guiding our lives. And indeed, many companies are increasingly offering AI-driven products and services to do uh, what they have to do, like guiding our lives. They're very uh, pervasive in our lives. And the value proposition of AI in general is that an AI can advise or automate decision making. And so we're talking in in house robots, self driving cars, LLMs, personal assistants. But the problem is that uh, an AI product is only profitable if users can trust the product and so can trust the algorithm with their decision more than anyone else. But for example, uh, the thing is, what if users don't know how your AI product will behave? And so the question now is, how can you trust? How can you make your AI product trustable and reliable? The answer is pretty simple, data, all right? So um, this is a like probably well known to all of you, but just to clarify, um, human learning and machine learning is very different things. Uh, uh, so what you're seeing in this slide is, is the picture of a, of a puppy. But what the algorithm or machine learning models actually see is not just that picture, it's more like a collection of three channels images, but more specifically what they, they look like is a matrix of numbers. So let's just by saying that the two types of learnings are different because we are looking at the same thing in different ways. And so we learn differently, um, which means that we have different challenges. Uh, so for example, if you tell to a toddler, uh, you want to, to teach to a toddler how to recognize an apple, well, you show them three samples of, of an apple, and that uh, little human being will be able to say, OK, this is an apple, this is not an apple. For machine learning models, it's very different. Normally, you need lots of data. That's why the models are called data hungry. And, uh, but what if you have like these two pictures sh also shown to humans? Would you be able to say that those are apples or not? Well, according to Google, they are. I, I have no idea whatsoever. But the, the thing is that we do have different challenges as humans uh, with respect to algorithms. And there is a very interesting paper, and it's like from a long ago, like 2009. So it's not like recent discovery. And, um, which is, this is this paper is called um, um, "Scary to Large but to Very Very Large Corpora for Natural Languages Ambiguation." So what they were trying to do in this paper was like different languages ambiguation tasks um, given to di different models, different algorithms, 
and with increasingly um, uh, uh, with, with, with different data sets in, increasing in size. And essentially the conclusion to that experiment was like, when you have enough data, even simple model can achieve very good performance. So in, in, in the end, it's all about data, it's not really about the algorithm. Um, interestingly, uh, so if you think about what has been the evolution of neural network architectures, for example, so we had your network research starting from back in 1943 right and like there's been an evolution over the years up until 2009 in which all of a sudden we have deep neural networks so we're talking AlexNet, GAN, UNet, ResNet, you name it so they're all different architectures so apparently in that decades more or less it seems that everything was all about the models um, this is because GPU computing came up and also, uh, you know, different data sets. But if you think about it, in that decades, if you read the paper from there, apart from very specific cases, like for example, UNET, or, which is like segmentation for medical imaging, everything seemed to be tested state of the art on two data sets. So all of a sudden research shifted into model is more important. Well, the reality is that we had BERT 2018, which is a large language model. And now we have GPT, then there is GPT-3, and finally we have ChatGPT. So what I'm trying to say in this slide is, of course you can have different architectures, different models, fine, but when it comes to the difference between GPT-3 and ChatGPT, the real difference is actually the data. This is when an LLM started really to work. And uh, um, so this is just another very long and convoluted way to say that data is very important. So we can absolutely conclude that AI models are data hungry. And so given this requirement, there's a push for open data set. And I found this, this uh, slide on the internet calling the GIGO effect. GIGO effect is actually garbage in, garbage out, meaning that yes, you do have data, but data have uh, need to be of good quality. It's not about to matter. It's not a matter of quantity. It's more about quality. So if you don't have reasonably good data to learn from, essentially you're not going to get anything out of your algorithms. And so AI models are data hungry, which means that there is a push for highly curated open data set. If you want to increase the amount of algorithms and research brought to the public uh, uh, on on on. Uh, uh, machine learning, for example, you need open data and you want high quality open data. But the underlying problem is that in order to answer a question about the AI system, an AI product, ethics, safety, researcher needs to see a copy of the data of other system. And it means that sometimes you can get a copy of the data if the data is publicly available. But in reality, not, that is not always the case because many reasons. There could be legitimate privacy, IP, uh, intellectual property meaning, uh, legal constraints or adversarial concerns, meaning that when you try to run a machine learning model, it's not always the case that you can just like download the data and do what you want to do. Because data sometimes cannot move the premises where data is collected. And um, Definitely the research in the recent years has done a lot into making a push towards releasing a repository of data sets which would be available. But the reality is that the majority of the data is not open because it cannot be open. And so the, what, I'm, what I'm arguing here is that most of the data that could be made publicly available has been made open already. And so the remaining uh, of, of data set are sitting there, essentially not being able to use it for different reasons. Not just even open it, not, just let, let alone using. Let, 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 let's, let's think about use, like seeing the data, not even using it is impossible sometimes. And so essentially what we need to do, like to unlock the, the possibility to use this data is to empower researchers to answer important questions about AI algorithms. And, but we need to do that without seeing a copy of the data they use to answer the questions and only with proper ethical oversight. 
We um, um, think that, so we hypothesize that this process could be called remote data science. Remote data science means that an external researcher or data scientist can create data science code, submit it to the organization holding the data, that organization being any entity owning, uh, holding some data, P public, non-public data, it doesn't really uh, make a difference, but of course we're talking data that cannot be released publicly. And so you can submit to the code. Uh, the organization or someone delegated for the organization is downloading, uh, uh, is getting the request, reviewing the request, and so once the request has been approved, you can download the answer to your question. And essentially you can use previously enhanced technologies to mitigate the privacy risks. And all of that without seeing the underlying data. So for those of you not familiar with pets, I, I'd just like to introduce very, them very briefly. Actually, I'm not mentioning, I'm just mentioning them, not introducing them at all. What, what, what suffice to say here is that pets at the moment is a very new research field, and there are so many different solutions to pets. Uh, if I didn't say uh, clearly, it stands for Privacy Enhancing Technologies, meaning that you can do data science with um, like guaranteeing that no privacy, no sensitive information will be uh, disclosed during the, the, during the process. And there are so many different technologies. Um, you can categorize some of them depending on if you want input privacy or you want output privacy or output ver verification or input verification. So we're talking some of the most popular one you might have heard before uh, could be canonization, differential privacy, or feathers of learning, for example. These are the most popular ones. But um, pets allow you to make this requirement because this is the main huge requirement we're trying to achieve doing remote data science. Answer a question using data you cannot see. That is something you can do with pets. But the problem is that individual pets fail to decouple use of data from gov governance of data. So, for, the, for example, for the learning, if you're familiar with that, you have a centralized governance over distributed data. This is how that works. Uh, in differential privacy, you had the noise to your data before sending to someone else. This is uh, the, um, the whole uh, principle. With secure enclaves, you essentially joint governance is possible but not required on data. And homomorphic encryption is also very interesting, which is like data science on encrypted data. Uh, you have to own the private key on a centralized way, and so on and so forth. So there are different other technologies that they do work in isolation, but sometimes they're not fitting entirely the governance of the data. So you cannot actually uh, use them out of the box all the times. And so underneath we have the algorithms, so the methods that we can use, but what is really interesting is actually the, the top of the slide, which is answer the question without seeing the data. So that is the ability that really matters. The algorithms are essentially the way in which you can do that. And, and what we're trying to do in open mind is providing a solution to actually not just having a single uh, technology, but a platform to use them all, in case, depending on the case. So in practice, the scenario we have in mind is like you have a data scientist and you, this data scientist is interested to answer a specific question on some data or, or on the organization on the other side. And the organization is of course retaining the governance over whatever's gonna happen on the data. And so ideally, this data scientist should study the data living and never moving out of the organization and without having to actually read the data, which it seems like uh, counterintuitive in the sense that how would you possibly do that without doing data science without actually looking at the data? And that's why I wanted to present you PySift. So our argue, uh, argument before that is pets must be combined to realize their potential. So by analogy, is looking like everyone is working on car parts, but we don't have a car yet because we don't have something to combine them all. And since we don't have that, it's gonna be difficult to envision a world with cars. So um, imagine a world with 
previously not technologies and what we can do with very important goal is to minimize the means use of data and maximize the innovation. And this is me introducing PySift. So PySift, first and foremost, is an open source project. So uh, um, PySift is developed by OpenMind, which is a non-profit organization. And um, it's, it's available on, on GitHub. It's uh, definitely uh, free to use and, and open source. And it's implemented in Python, of course. So I'm just going to show you step by step how the process of remote data science look like in, in, uh, in PySift. So you have a researcher and the organization willing to talk in this remote data science process. First is the organization launches the PySift data site. We, uh, a data site is no, you can imagine that like a, a, a web server, a private, uh, a, web, a private Apache web server for private data. Um, the admin of the organization is essentially setting up this node, and the first it does is loads algorithm metadata into the server, uh, creates an account for external researchers so that people can actually access to the server, and then it's done, essentially goes and takes coffee. So now that the server is ready, is ready uh, on the other hand, we have the external researchers willing to start a submission to the, to the organization through PySift. So how does it look like? Essentially, first off, researchers logs into the, uh, to the data site and um, get an answer to what is, uh, what is possible to do on the data, like get answered, uh, answers to allowed questions. And this is, where, this is when the data scientist is actually embedding the previous analytic technologies bit. So um, at this point, the, the researchers has submitted a request, which is a project proposal, uh, sent through uh, to the organization admin um, through PySift. So at this point, the admin reviews the request, which is indeed including two things. On one hand, is reviewing the purpose of the study, which is submitted in the, into the request, and it's also reviewing the actual code that the data science is willing to run. It's executing the code, either locally or remotely on the data, and then submits the result when this gets approved. So at this point, the, uh, the result is available, and the researcher can actually get the result, sorry, it is actually get the result and um, get the result on, uh, for their algorithm run on, on private data. Um, last thing I want to share before moving into a, a um, quick demo is um, we, we've been collaborating with some um, partners uh, in the past, um, including Twitter, Dailymotion, LinkedIn. Um, they've been having um, deployment of PySift servers on their premises in order to share the data. And this is actually brand new. So we started a couple of weeks ago, actually, a collaboration with Reddit, and this is really, really amazing. So if you're on Reddit and you go on Reddit for researchers, Reddit is willing to host um, PySIF domains, uh, PySIF data sites, uh, servers in order to share and, and like to make available to everyone ready data. And you may imagine how uh, interesting ready data could be in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, sensitive information and everything. Um, and, and so we're working together with Reddit in order to have uh, a PySafe deployment available to everyone to actually log in uh, and, uh, uh, and use ready data through, through PySafe. Uh, before moving into the demo, we are, we are a community of 16,000 people on Slack. Uh, if you wanted to join Slack, that would be mostly appreciated. Um, and um, we actually, in starting to go back to the community, and this is part of my commitment and, and what I'm actually doing right now. So if you're willing to join our Slack, that would be amazing. Um, and there will be a, a link to the, so join OM Slack. Uh, the link and the QR code will be done, will be shared again later. So now is the, the demo part. Uh, I have five minutes plus questions. Uh, let's see what I can do. Um, it's going to be live. I, I promise you, I 
cleared all the notebooks. And, and PySift actually works in notebooks already. Um, so let me, is this big enough for you, first off? Um, any better? Right, so essentially, what I, this is just the introduction. Very, like, in, in summary, what have been um, uh, described so far. The workflow is a data scientist connects to, the, to, to a data owner, and in PySift, there is an actual separation between two main roles. And this is what we're gonna, call, we're gonna see in the demo. We have a data owner, which is the one in charge of setting up the domain, setting up the, the data site, and like reviewing the requests. And uh, the data scientist, who's the external researchers who wants to access the data site. And so if you wanna have a look, another look from a data perspective, uh, which is this picture here on the bottom, essentially this is like a request response kind of workflow. And I'm gonna tell you in a second how data are organized because this is how effectively uh, explains the workflow in practice. So let me jump directly into that. All right, so PySift can be deployed in many ways, but the interesting bit is that PySift includes a development server, meaning that you can spawn a PySift server directly locally, you don't have to deploy anything, and this is entirely uh, intended for development purposes, uh, very similar to what you have in Django framework, for example, like you have the development server uh, you don't need to do anything, it just works. Um, so, I just set up, uh, your, let me just reduce the code a little bit. So, I'm just spawning the server here. So, it's running locally in my machine. I call it EuroPython test domain. And it's running now, so I can connect um, as, a, as an admin. I'm using default credentials at this point. Um, so, you, you get all this rich output if you're running into notebooks. So welcome to EuroPython test domain and you have all the information and something you can do. So we can get access to projects, request users or data set like we're doing. In order to set up the data site, we wanted to start creating, a, uploading a data. And this is where it gets interesting in PySift. So in PySift, whenever you have a data set, essentially every data set is composed by two parts. You have the uh, and this is the data owner view of things. So someone who's in charge of managing the, the, the data site. So we have two versions of the data. We have the real true data, which will be always available only to the data owner, never to the data scientist. And we also have what we call mock data, meaning we have a synthetic uh, um, 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 artificial um, version of the data that will be always be, uh, made public and the only purpose of mock data is just to, ha to provide to external users something to work with when they need to prepare the algorithms. So let me just show you an example of what I mean. Let's say we're having breast cancer data set taken from scikit-learn, something very simple and not requiring internet to get. So I load the data here and this is how data looks like, right? So, first off, let me create very simple two versions of this data, two mock versions of this data. One is, let me zoom a little bit. Um, one is, so simply put, it's just like add, adding the, the mean of each feature into the data plus random numbers. And for the labels, we actually scramble the, the labels so that in case of any pattern, there is no pattern any, anymore. Um, so we have two versions of the data set, and this is how our data sets look like in PySift. Uh, let me increase a little bit so you can see better. So a data set is a, composition, is a collection of multiple assets. And this abstraction is very interesting to me because it, it, like, it tries to uh, encapsulate uh, different use cases. So for example, you can have a data set composed by feature and labels, two different assets. You can have a data set composed by multiple assets as in longitudinal, longitudinal data. So like data taken at different times. And, and it's a very flexible representation. So what we're gonna do here is just like creating a SIFT data set object, creating two assets. And when we create the assets, essentially we set the data and the mock version of the data. And when we're done, we add the assets to the data set 
And this is how the data set looks like. So the data set, we get reach output here. Uh, we have a description and a name, and the data set is composed by two assets, the features and labels. The last thing we need is we need to upload this data to the data site, and this is now officially available online. So, and this is the data we got online. So we have one data set, two assets, and all the metadata information here. The last thing we need before moving to the data science notebook is needing to create access credentials. So we have data, Owen data owner, a Rachel data scientist willing to, to play here. So now we have a new user. Uh, as I said, I'm using like default credentials. So we have Jane Doe. And Rachel Science is the data scientist, is someone with data scientist uh, role uh, willing to access the domain. So let's now see how things look like from a data science perspective. We log in into the node. Oh, sorry, I forgot the import. Uh, import sift as sy. There you go. So, and um, what I mean. Yeah, sorry. It was defined above. Right. Okay. So logged in. Once we logged in, we see that there is a data set. We access the data set by name, um, uh, which is unique in the database. And we saw that the database is indeed composed by two assets. We got the assets. And we actually get access to the mock data. So far, so good. Mock is supposed to be public, but when it comes to access data, as you can see, we're not seeing anything. So the data, and just to clarify, what features and labels really are, are just pointers to what is in the, in the repository. Actually, since we're running the, the local development server with uh, Verbosity on, you're actually seeing that as soon as I make um, an execution here, you get some information on the log that, of requests made to the local server. Um, so let's say I want to prepare for a machine learning experiment. Something very simple, nothing particularly um, rocket science. So like partition data normalization, model training, and matrix calculation. So this is a function which is expecting features and labels and some seed for, for um, reproducibility. And I run this function, I get these numbers, so far so good. So this is actually working locally. Let me make this something that can become a code to run on PySift. And the way in which you do that, straight, very straightforward. You, you need two things. Essentially, PySift uh, thinks in terms of uh, closures. So if you have experience with um, Kubernetes and uh, MLflow, similar things. So when you want to impact some code and like send it to the server, you have to make a closure, meaning that you need to make a function with all the imports in the body. So we're moving everything inside the body so that every, all the code is consistent. And the only thing you need in order to make it a PySift function is indeed um, a decorator, which is sift dot sift function single use. And you, you specify essentially the data that should be used by this function. Thank you. So you make it, um, you make it a sift function. We access some metadata. And we see that what is this, this has become is some code that we want to submit. Then we create a project. I'm jumping because I'm always uh, almost uh, out of time. We create a project. We attach this code request to the project and we send it to the server. And if we try to run the code, we got an error because it says you, you don't, you're not allowed to run it. You need permission. So super briefly, uh, and I'm going to share this on Discord for all of you in order to reproduce. Uh, the data owner at this point connects, see the request. There is a pending request from a data scientist uh, and got all the information here. Um, we get the request. We get the code. We want to run, assuming this is all good. Um, make it, I'm running locally. It works. Running on private data. It works. I deposit the results. Fine. And last bit, I'm a data scientist. I get the reference. Request is approved. And I can run the code. I get the result. Everything works. All right. So let me just jump to the last slide to thank you so very much.
Thank you. Uh, please reach me out on Discord. I'm here the whole week. And join, join, join Slack if you want to. And I'm very open to questions. I'm always around. So please feel free to stop me there. Thank you so much. <laughs>